Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the day 14 of uh, Minashtra Workshop Series 2020. Uh, so today with us we have uh, Rashekar uh, Mohopatra, so who is currently a PhD candidate at uh, Australian National University and previously he did his bachelor's at uh, Indian Institute of uh, Science, uh, IASC, uh, Bengaluru. And uh, for the past uh, two years, he has been working on uh, turbulence and its various applications, uh, mainly concerning uh, intergalactic and intercluster medium. And while he was at IASC, he has also uh, briefly uh, worked on uh, biophysics, if I can classify it like that, like basically taking some uh, mathematical modeling and understanding the, some uh, and modeling um, some biological systems like uh, uh, he studied electrical activity and a mathematical model of uh, uterine tissue with fibroflasts. That's a very interesting topic. Uh, and he has also been part of some outreach activities. Uh, and he has also published a paper uh, with the title uh, Turbulence in Intra, uh, Intracluster Medium uh, Simulations Observables in Remote Dynamics uh, as part of uh, MNRAS. So I think with that brief intro, Rashid, we can kick it off. Yeah, thanks, Surendra. Uh, yes, so today I'll be talking to you about uh, mainly what I'm doing in my PhD. Uh, the research topic of my PhD is basically stratified turbulence in the intercluster medium, which in short is also known as ICM. Uh, my primary supervisor uh, here is Christoph Frederick, and I also work with Pratik Sharma from IIC. Uh, I have actually continued working with him even uh, after my uh, undergraduate uh, research uh, project with him. Uh, this is my web page uh, if you want to visit. There's not really much there. Uh, yeah, I would also like to begin by acknowledging the Nanawal people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which uh, we, or at least I am here today and I pay my respect to elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people. Okay. Uh, so starting with uh, who am I? Uh, this is a picture that I took actually. This is from Siding Spring Observatory, which is the observatory uh, that ANU has. Uh, and I am a PhD student uh, from India, yes, you know that. Uh, I'm, an I'm a student at the astronomy department. Uh, well, this may not be considered a hobby in India, but here bikers are rare, so I am into motorcycling uh, and hiking. And today I'll be talking to you on about this topic. Well, if uh, this was a different situation, I would have been giving you an actual talk like that, but well, uh, now it will be through Zoom. So uh, let's start with what a galaxy cluster is. So, Galaxy cluster is basically a cluster of a lot of galaxies. Uh, in this picture, you're looking at Avid 2744, which, also, which is also known as Pandora's cluster. It's really pretty with lots and lots of galaxies with many different colors. Uh, so this is an optical wavelength, uh, what we see ourselves, right? But if you look at it in um, X-ray, you see the red gas. You see a lot of red gas in between all these different galaxies in a galaxy cluster. And we can even model the dark matter profile in this galaxy cluster, and that basically sh shows you the blue regions. Okay. Remember that the gas is really hot. It's 1 million Kelvin hot. Uh, uh, so it can go up uh, as high as 100 million Kelvins as well in different galaxy clusters. Galaxy clusters are really massive. That's why. Uh, uh, they can cause lensing around them. Here you, we see a smiling galaxy cluster, but the smiling effect is because of strong lensing, which is basically there are some galaxies behind the galaxy cluster and the light from them is bent around this galaxy clusters because they're so massive uh, and it looks like a smiley face. You may have come across this in Ion's talk or any of the other talks before as well. So uh, galaxy clusters are up to a few megaparsecs across. So megaparsec is basically 10 to the power 6 parsecs or it's around 10 to the power 6 times 3 light years. Okay. Uh, but we want to focus on the regions close to the center of the galaxy cluster. 
So on the left here, you're seeing a very zoomed in portion of uh, a galaxy, of the Perseus galaxy cluster. And the lepton is an optical again, and it's uh, around 100 kiloparsecs in size. Now you see a very bright, uh, big elliptical galaxy in the center. Uh, that's called the BCG or the brightest cluster galaxy. So most galaxy clusters will have a big red elliptical galaxy in the center. Now, if you look at the same image in X-ray again, uh, you'll see the intracluster medium, which is basically that hot uh, 10 million Kelvin gas that pervades the region between the galaxies in a cluster. Okay, uh, in, and this uh, gas is so hot that uh, most all the gas is basically ionized. Okay, uh, so, and uh, because it's uh, ionized uh, and it's at that high temperature, it emits uh, in thermal bremsstrahlung. So you must have come across bremsstrahlung emission. Uh, and the gas is optically thin, so all the radiation that is emitted in this bremsstrahlung uh, in X-rays, uh, bremsstrahlung X-rays uh, escapes. And so the gas cools down by emitting radiatively. Now, if you know the formula for bremsstrahlung emission, it's not necessary. It basically depends on the square of density. N is the small n is the density, and lambda is a temperature. It is a function that's uh, weakly dependent on the temperature. So we'll assume that lambda is a constant here. So basically, uh, denser gas cools faster, and rarer gas cools slower. Right. Now, a galaxy cluster is uh, stratified in the sense that just around the BCG, you have the densest gas. And then you have rarer and rarer gas occurring outside. And the gravitational uh, profile of, in a, of gas in a cluster is, is mostly set by the dark matter halo. So there's a lot of dark matter that sets the acceleration due to gravity. And uh, then the gas just follows that, most, mostly follows that. And then it's uh, basically like, it's very similar to our atmosphere where our Earth sets the atmosphere. Uh, Earth sets, uh, the gravitational force and then the gas is just stratified, right? Uh, now we have the densest gas close to the center of the cluster and the rarer gas as you move away. Now, because the cooling rate uh, is uh, higher for the denser gas, the gas in the in inner regions of a galaxy cluster, which is closer to the center, they will cool much faster. Uh, and the outside gas, it will cool much slower, mainly because the cooling rate is proportional to density squared. So if the inner regions are cooling much faster, they will cool and form clumps, right? You cool and you contract. Uh, and then what happens is the outer regions, they lose the pressure support. So they're basically sitting on top of this gas, which has suddenly contracted faster than this gas, outside gas would contract. So this gas starts falling inward, which is what these arrows show here. Uh, it's called a cooling flow. So the outside gas also starts falling inward. And then it also starts cooling rapidly because it falls, its uh, density increases and then uh, it's, it would start cooling faster. So th this is called uh, a cooling flow. Now from a cooling flow, you can basically model how much, so there is nothing arresting this gas. If there is nothing arresting this gas from cooling, uh, it will just radiate away all its heat and it will go down to molecular cloud scales. And then it will start forming stars. I guess you have had an introductory lecture to star formation sometime. So basically, if the gas cools down and you know how much gas is going into molecular gas phase, you can have some. Uh, you can calculate how much estimated stars will form from this gas. But BCGs don't really form a lot of stars. They are actually red and dead mostly. You have a lot of gas that is supposed to be supplied from this cooling flow, but that never comes. Uh, uh, never goes on to form stars. So this is known as the cooling flow problem. Now, what is called, so basically we are not forming that much stars, which means there is something that is preventing this gas from cooling, right? So there is some other heating mechanism. Now, here we see two bubbles. You see, uh, there are these two uh, areas where there's no X-ray emission, which means that gas has been displaced there. And in a couple of slides, I'll show you that this is actually caused by active galactic nuclei feedback, which means the black holes in the center release 
uh, AGN jets, which means they release a lot of energy in concentrated areas, and that heats up this gas, and basically that somehow arrests this cooling. And the feedback, so this is again a, a different galaxy cluster. Here you see three different wavelengths. The blue is uh, X-ray, red is radio, and uh, rest is optical. So again, here you see that uh, you see that there are these red uh, lobes corresponding to the areas where the blue gas is absent. Okay. Uh, so what has happened is the AGN jet injects energy in tiny areas, and then these basically expand and move out and ex uh, uh, and then you can calculate that the total X-ray luminosity, which is responsible for the cooling of the ICM, is approximately equal to the power injected by the AGN jets, which means there is some sort of thermal balance. But the question that we don't, uh, uh, the, uh, that we don't know the answer to is, what's the mechanism through which AGN jets feed energy to the ICM? Because AGN jets basically inject energy to very, very tiny regions uh, compared to the scale of a galaxy cluster. Here you see we are looking at a megaparsec region almost, and AGN jets are in a much smaller scales. So how does that energy uh, spread out all throughout this huge megaparsec scale? Now, one of the mechanisms is turbulence, right? Turbulence, can, you can, it's basically you stir, AGN jets are stirring the ICM around, and then because you're injecting energy through turbulence, that somehow ends up heating up the entire intercluster medium. Now, I can show you an animation which shows how this galaxy cluster feed, how the feedback in this galaxy cluster may work. Now, I was uh, telling that this is a hot gas bubble, and this is a simulation by one of my earlier group members in IASC. Uh, so you see that the AGN jet uh, is, uh, so there's a supermassive black hole in the center, and it's feeding, uh, giving out these AGN jets, and then that's being injected into this ICM gas, and then it's exploding and these bubbles are rising up, right? So <clears throat> this is how this feedback is supposed to work. But I mean, this is just a simulation. We don't really know what's happening. Now, one important way uh, in which we can understand how this is working is by measuring the velocities of the gas in the ICM. Basically, if there is some sort of motion, uh, there's some sort of turbulence in the ICM, then uh, just by calculating the turbulent energy and that you can estimate what's the dissipation rate of turbulence. And uh, from that, you can tr try to see whether this model actually works or not, whether turbulence is the method through which AGN jets inject energy into the entire ICM gas. Okay, now we are, uh, we'll look at Perseus cluster again. On the left side, we are looking at the X-ray surface brightness image, which is basically, you look at the Perseus galaxy cluster in X-ray, and this is what you'll see. Well, this is a false color image, of course. Uh, it's not uh, red, yellow, and blue. Uh, and then what you do is you take the average at each radius and you divide that average out so that you get the fluctuations uh, at each radius. So the right side image is actually the fluctuations in the X-ray surface brightness, okay? Uh, now, these features that you see here, you see uh, these sloshy uh, features that you see are this due to turbulence. Now, the uh, one way to uh, know whether those are really due to turbulence is to measure the turbulent gas velocities, right? Now, what's the most obvious method to measure velocities in a gas? So, uh, for uh, X-rays, uh, we can't really detect them from uh, while being on the Earth's surface because the atmosphere will block them. So we need to send X-ray telescopes. Uh, so this is the Hitomi Space Telescope, which went up uh, in 2016, and it was active for a couple of months before it spun out of control and uh, sadly crashed. Uh, but uh, this Hitomi uh, satellite, when it was up there for a month, it did some really amazing work. Uh, it got a spectra of the central regions of uh, the Perseus galaxy cluster. Okay, uh, now on the left, what you're seeing is the areas of the Perseus galaxy cluster that Hitomi looked at. So the squares represent what area we were looking at, okay? Uh, 
and then on the right side you are seeing spectrum so the spectrum uh, is basically number of photons that you are getting per wavelength here we have just represented the wavelength uh, as energy okay uh, so you see that we have uh, hitomi had really high spectral accuracy in the sense that it had these uh, energy bins that you see there less than 0.01 kilo electron volts this was not seen in any other x-ray spectrometer before so it was an amazing instrument which sadly only worked for a month okay uh, now uh, remember that the gas is around 10 to the power 7 kelvin hot and what we are looking for is doppler broadening due to turbulence okay uh, now the because the gas is 10 to the power 7 kelvin hot the uh, normally the, all most of the smaller gas will be ionized and the only gas that you will see will be like uh, starting from oxygen oxygen in its sixth ionized state or uh, uh, basically very heavily ionized state ions for example here we are looking at iron in its 25th ionized state so it means iron uh, we are looking at iron's helium alpha line which means iron basically has two electrons and then we are looking at some transitions in that okay uh, now the reason we also had to choose iron is because uh, the thermal velocity of gas varies with the inverse square root of mass of the ion. And for lower mass ions, this gas is so hot that the thermal velocity is higher than the turbulent velocity. Whereas when you go to higher mass ions, such as iron, the thermal velocity is smaller than the turbulent velocity. So in this case, we can actually measure the turbulent velocity. And for this, we really need very high accuracy, uh, as you see in this data. So no other X-ray uh, spectrometer has this accuracy uh, as of now. So the next missions, which are which will be followed to Hitomi, will come in five, six years, or maybe ten years. So the velocity that we got, sigma v is basically the standard deviation. Uh, or the, we got, the, we found the velocity was like 164 kilometers per second. Now, now that we don't have a method, way to directly measure the velocity because uh, we don't have the spectral resolution to resolve turbulent and thermal velocities differently. Uh, okay, uh, Radha's question, I can actually answer that right now. So turbulent velocity will be uniform for all the different gas ions and uh, uh, thermal velocity will be basically dependent on the mass of the ion. And it will also be related to the pressure, whereas turbulent uh, velocities will be different. So if you know the temperature of the gas, you would know what the thermal velocity is. It's, but then you see some extra broadening, right? That is basically due to the turbulent velocity. You can also think of this as, uh, let's say you have uh, uh, a cup of water. Okay, uh, That's basically standing, but it also has some thermal velocity. But when you stir it really, really fast, now the ve extra velocity that it has is the turbulent velocity. <clears throat> which you can probably measure. Okay, there are many other ways to measure turbulence as well, is that you can look at uh, gas, you can look at uh, velocity, uh, the relation between velocities of two different gas molecules separated by some distance. And then in turbulence, this uh, the relation between gas velocities as a function of distance, uh, act, so, uh, they're actually related, they're correlated according to some scaling laws. Basically, delta V between two gas molecules will be proportional to L to the power one by three. So that, that relation is also not there for thermal velocity. So there are some ways by which you can know that these velocities are turbulent and not thermal. Uh, I hope uh, that answered your question. Now, <clears throat> uh, what's the... Uh, What's another method? I'll just discuss three, four methods. So uh, now if you have, um, well, if, so, uh, okay, let's uh, see in this way. So when, um, let's say you are stirring air very fast, okay, your air is moving around really fast, then there can be density fluctuations in the air, right? So basically when you're moving gas around too fast, some areas will have high density of gas and some areas will have low density of gas, right? Similarly, in, uh, in the ICM also, if gas is moving around too fast, some areas will have really high density and some areas will have low density. And now you remember that 
the icm gas radiation is proportional to the density squared so the radiation will amplify these fluctuations because the separation is now of the order of density squared right so they will be visible in the surface brightness maps so when you basically look at the galaxy cluster there will be these fluctuations which i already told you about and these fluctuate from these fluctuations you can try to back calculate the velocity now this is a somewhat complicated method i'll try to break it down into steps uh, and uh, try to uh, simplify it when i explain so you have this surface brightness map so which is basically you looked at the x ray image that's the left side image and then what you did at each radius you basically divided the uh, mean value of the surface brightness so you got the surface brightness fluctuations on the right side now you do something called a uh, now you calculate something called a power spectrum okay so what is a power spectrum uh, it's basically you take the fourier transform of the surface brightness fluctuations which are on the right side and then uh, you basically square it okay and then uh, uh, you have surface brightness in uh, as a function of now wave number k okay uh, and from that <coughs> you do <coughs> you say that oh this is proportional to density squared Uh, so now i'll convert this into density fluctuations okay so that's uh, what you do surface brightness fluctuations you uh, make a power spectrum and then you convert into density power spectrum and then you say that density and velocity are related in the sense that areas where you have very high velocity uh, there the gas will be all smooshed and some areas will have uh, no gas so basically higher velocities will call cause higher density fluctuations and you say that oh these are related so i'll calculate the velocity from the density okay and then people use this relation between the fourier amplitudes of density and velocity uh, called eta okay um, so let's just say that uh, people use eta to convert between density to velocity well velocity is normalized by mach number no, sorry by the speed of sound so we are actually talking about the mach number here uh and in the end after all these complicated methods you get uh, the velocity as a function of wave number basically velocity in the fourier space okay the uh now uh, this actually gave us good match with the directly measured velocities by the hitomi space satellite okay uh however this eta ratio which is a part of one part one small part of this complicated conversion uh is not well calibrated so that is one of the things i'll focus on in the later part of this talk is how exactly can we calibrate uh, these ratios between density and velocity that's something that our group here in anu spe specializes on okay uh, now uh, a third method to measure turbulence okay so there is something called uh, thermal sg effect so sg stands for suniev zeldovich okay uh you have come across the cosmic microwave background radiation right uh have you uh, just someone type yes in the comments if you have come across it uh in the chat sorry not the comments yeah okay so uh, cosmic uh, uh now the icm electrons are so hot that uh when a cmb background photon uh when it interacts with a electron so generally when photons electron interact with electrons you expect compton scattering right uh so the electron goes off at some angle and the photon goes off at some angle we did this question here we did, probably would have solved this problem sometime but here what happens is inverse compton scattering uh which means uh the electron actually imparts energy uh, to the cmb photon so around a galaxy cluster the there's an uh, excess amount of cmb radiation okay so on the right side you see this is the cmb radiation around the coma galaxy cluster so you see there is all this excess uh, cmb around it okay now <coughs> uh, what does the uh, what what's the so how do we how can we calculate uh, the excess so the energy of the uh, electron is basically proportional to its temperature right and the total amount of upscatter that a cmb photon can undergo is proportional to the density times temperature of the entire path that it transfer that it passes through and if you assume an ideal gas equation of state uh, for the icm gas 
Then density times temperature is basically pressure. It's proportional to pressure with some constant. So <clears throat> the excess uh, CMB around a galaxy cluster actually gives you an integral of the an, an, a line of sight integral of the pressure of the ICM. Okay. And now once you have the pressure, you, you can calculate uh, velocities from pressure. Just like we are calculating density from density fluctuations, we are calculating pressure. You can do the same uh, with these. So I'll show a couple more slides just to uh, present this idea a little more clearly. So you have, you now have the CMB excess. So this is the Compton Y profile. Uh, and then you calculate the fluctuations profile, okay. uh, similar to how we are doing surface brightness and surface brightness fluctuations. Then you normalize these fluctuations again, like we were doing for the X-ray. Uh, <clears throat> and then, uh, then now you again do the power spectrum. Okay, uh, so you plot this as a function of the wave wave number, and in the end you obtain uh, a pressure power spectrum. So you convert this delta y into pressure, and then you get a pressure power spectrum. Now note that uh, all these different lines, so from purple till red, these are all, uh, so these are measurable in radio wavelengths, okay? Uh, whereas, uh, sorry, the purple lines are from X-ray. So these are from X-ray measurements, which have used the density to velocity relation. Whereas in the red, green, blue, yellow, brown, and black, we have used the uh, pressure uh, Fourier transforms. You can see that the pressure, the SZ effect data that we have, it stops at around 500 kiloparsecs, right? Whereas the X-ray covers this inner region of the galaxy cluster. So X-rays have really good resolution, but uh, uh, the SZ effect data, it is not going below 100 kiloparsecs. So we don't have enough resolution. Uh, now there's a fourth method to measure turbulence. This is very recent. This paper came out uh, a few months back in 2020 itself. Now, remember I told you that the ICM gas cools down, but uh, we don't see that much cold gas. Uh, so, but the ICM gas is also multi-phase. There are like uh, these, so the colored pictures that you see here is basically cold molecular gas or uh, Lyman alpha emitting gas. So that's like 10 to the power four Kelvin gas, okay? Whereas the gray background that you see is 10 to the power 7 Kelvin. This is the same Perseus cluster that I've been talking about, about most of the time. So this colder phase gas, uh, which is at, let's say, 10 to the power 4 Kelvin. Now, in this case, the thermal velocity will be much lower than the turbulent velocity, right? If, and if we assume that the cold gas is basically moving along with the hot gas, okay? So you can measure the velocities of this cold gas, and then from that, you can correlate it with the velocities of the hot gas. And you say that, oh, because the cold gas is moving at this speed, the hot gas is also moving at around the same speed. Uh, so this is very recent, uh, as I just said, uh, and uh, people obtain velocity as a function of length scale. So earlier I was showing you velocity in the Fourier space. This is just like the Fourier transform of that. Here, people have plotted velocity as a function of the real space length. And here you see uh, that there are some peaks at uh, in the red and green uh, plots. There are some peaks at different sizes, and they actually correspond to the size of the bubbles. So a few slides back, I was saying that AG and jets drive uh, inject energy, and then the hot they basically inject energy in this tiny regions, which become hot, and then they rise. And uh, these are supposed to drive turbulence in the ICM. Well, here we see that uh, the velocity. Uh, as a function of length scale, it actually peaks at those things uh, at that length scale corresponding to the bubble size. So this is actually a really important result. It shows that it is basically a direct detection of uh, black hole driven turbulence in the ICM. Uh, so yeah, because the velocity peaks at that length scale, that means there is nothing driving uh, velocities at scales larger than the size of the bubbles in the areas we are looking at. So that's where we say that that's the driving length scale and that corresponds to the size of bubbles. Okay, uh, yeah, so this had the 10 to the power four, well, I'm calling 10 to the power four K as cold gas, but that's also the surface temperature of the sun. Uh, and the 10 to the power seven K is hot gas. 
Uh, bubbles around the cluster, they show no emission. Could they contain dark matter? Uh, so the bubbles are actually, uh, so that gas, it's, it's basically just gas though. It cannot be dark matter because it won't interact with radiation. Uh, so it won't interact with the AG and jets. Dark matter won't do that. It will only interact gravitationally, right? Uh, well, the regions will still have dark matter. The regions where, uh, so imagine what, uh, I'll just go back to one of the previous slides to answer Atherva's question. Uh, yeah, this slide, okay. So basically, initially you had the blue gas, the blue X-ray emitting gas everywhere around. Now what happened is you injected a lot of energy into two tiny regions, okay, which are corresponding to the bubble areas. Now what happened is because this gas was very hot, it starts expanding. And then uh, when you inject energy into this tiny region of gas, it starts expanding. And because it is expanding, it becomes lighter, right? Uh, uh, its uh, density becomes lower. And that's why that gas starts rising up. Okay, it's basically, uh, it is convex. Yeah, convection basically works in similar ways. Anyway, yeah, so basically the, uh, it's basically like a bubble rising up. Okay, uh, that's why it's called bubble. Uh, and then because it is so hot, it it is even hotter than the other part of ICM gas. It is seen in radio wavelengths. Uh, so these are radio lobes and they emit synchrotron emission. Uh, if you uh, can explain synchrotron emission later, but you can even look it up later. Uh, so these red, red radio lo lobes basically emit in radio wavelengths and that's how we know that they exist. Um, so many galaxy clusters are associated with uh, similar radio lobes, which are corresponding to the uh, energy injected by AG jets. Okay, <clears throat> now that we have come across many of these methods of uh, measuring turbulence, we'll go to some of the work that I do. I hope we are at like halfway point. Are we? Yeah, so let's go. Okay, so this is this will be my work. Uh, <coughs> any more questions at this point? Okay, Raghav. Yes, that's true that Asian feedback can also chemically enrich the ICM. Uh, but not a lot, it's not spreading around uh, as much. Uh, so for the ICM, we actually assume the metallicity, which is the concentration of different metals uh, to be one third solar, uh, one third the, of the solar metallicity, which is actually quite low. Uh, yeah, it basically doesn't spread around as much from what uh, I understand. And also the amount of gas coming out is very small compared to the total amount of bary baryonic mass in the ICM. So you can inject some metals, but the halo is so big compared to the tiny uh, central region that uh, it's probably insignificant. But I think people still study it probably more so in the very central regions uh, where it can be somewhat important. <clears throat> Whereas if you're looking at just galaxy scales at the halo around a single galaxy, their uh, uh, metal injection by AGN feedback is actually quite important or like any sort of feedback. Okay, stratified turbulence. So we see this every uh, in many different astrophysical systems in our oceans on Earth, in atmosphere. This is, I think, a picture of the Voyager spacecraft. And you see, I think, mesosphere, uh, stratosphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, and the one above it, I forgot. Is it ionosphere? Yes, you see, basically see three of those atmospheric layers here. Now you see it in atmospheres of other planets, stars and clusters. So you see it in Jupiter's surface, all this uh, amazing turbulent features. Uh, you also see it in on the sun, you see convection currents on the sun. Uh, also inside the sun, there are radiative uh, layers uh, called the, and this is solar tachocline, all those regions. Stratified turbulence is really important to study them. And uh, I'll be characterizing them by two numbers. Here I've given the definition of the first number, which is the Richardson number uh, or fruit number, which I'll introduce later on in the talk. In the uh, first 10 slides, I'll be using Richardson number. Okay. Uh, this is due to historical reasons. 
uh, which is the what I followed for my first paper. <laughs> okay, uh, so um, Richardson number is the ratio between uh, buoyancy force to turbulent force. So basically, you have stratified, you have stratified gas, and uh, you you have a gradient in pressure, and you have gravity. So if you, um, I mean, basically, you have buoyancy, and if you have turbulence, there is some force uh, associated with, I think this will be much easier to explain once I have the equations. Okay, so let's go to them. Uh, uh, before we go to that, the Richardson number for galaxy clusters. So what's the numbers that we are looking at? So for cool core galaxy clusters, uh, uh, if you assume that the gas is moving at around 300 kilometers per second and the driving length scale is around a 10th kiloparsec, then Richardson number varies from one to around 10 to the power minus four as you keep going outwards from the center of a galaxy cluster. Uh, these are just theoretical calculations from some models of the density and pressure. And for non cool core galaxy cluster, this is another type of galaxy cluster where the driving length scale is much larger and the driving velocities are also much larger. So there the Richardson number can go even higher up to like 10 and it can, but it depends very strongly on uh, the driving length scale and the velocities that you choose. So don't assume that these numbers are very correct. These are just assumptions. This, uh, the ballpark regime would be anywhere between Richardson number 100 to 10 to the power minus one in the central uh, regions of galaxy clusters, because there's a lot of uncertainty in the velocities and the driving length scale. Okay. Uh, coming to relevant time scales. Okay. Uh, so this is the most important time scale here. Uh, called the brent voisala oscillation time scale. Now we are, assume that we have a, an exponential profile. Okay, here you, we are looking at uh, integrated density, let's say. So you have x direction into the, uh, into the slide, uh, into the page or your screen, and y and z are on the surface, okay. And we set our density profile such that it's constant along a plane, whereas as you move along the z direction, we have pressure going as P naught e to the power minus Z by HP and density going as uh, rho naught e to the power minus Z by H rho. Okay, this is a box, uh, a cube basically, okay? And then you can also define entropy, where entropy is P by rho to the power gamma. So, you, so equivalently you will get some definition for HS as well, uh, which will be dependent on HP and H rho, okay? Uh, now, Let's say you displace uh, a blob of a parcel of gas along the Z direction by Delta Z. Okay. And uh, you do this slowly, uh, slow enough such that the, it is always in pressure equilibrium with its immediate surroundings as you are raising it, raising it by Delta Z, but yeah, but it's not getting a chance to exchange energy with its uh, immediate surroundings. <coughs> in that case, the gas will, uh, this process will be a diabetic. And you can calculate the change in density of the gas as you raise it to a height, delta Z. So you're displacing a parcel of gas. Now in the new environment, it's in pressure equilibrium with its surrounding, but its density is different. Now, because the gas is density stratified, uh, this will lead to oscillation. So you, it will basically be an excess density if you're raising it up, or it will be <coughs> less density when you bring it down. And it will lead to oscillations. Uh, these are easy to calculate. You can look up brunt voisel oscillations uh, later on after the talk. And the frequency at which this oscillation happens is called the brunt voisel oscillation time scale. Okay. Uh, now, the condition for a stable, strat stably stratified medium is that when you raise this, then it should try to fall back down. Right. That otherwise the stratification profile will not be stable. And that gives you that uh, the condition H rho by HP should be less than gamma. Okay. This is something that we implemented in our simulations. And then we can also define because uh, this delta rho, the change in, uh, if you're raising it to a height, that is basically causing this uh, <coughs> oscillations. We can define a buoyant velocity, which is related to uh, density fluctuations. Okay. So we call it G delta rho by rho divided by N. Uh, and then <clears throat> there's an eddy turnover time scale associated with turbulence, which is given as uh, L divided by UL. So L is the length scale that we are talking about and UL is the velocity at that particular length scale. So that's the eddy turnover time. Uh, 
then let's look at euler equations i i'm guessing most of you would have taken some fluid dynamics course uh, during your undergraduate or you would have come across euler equations at some point uh, just type in yes if you have uh, yeah it was so the first in one is uh, okay the first one is mass conservation second is momentum third is energy uh, and fourth is a definition of energy and fifth is the equation of state okay uh, now i'll just highlight the extra terms that we have here so we have some sort of external forcing for turbulence we need to churn turbulence okay uh, so uh, because you have some dissipation happening uh, so there's viscosity at the smallest length scales okay there's viscosity which happens at tiniest length scale and turbulence at the highest length scale so you need to inject energy in order for turbulence uh, to establish turbulence in any system okay and you need to keep injecting energy uh, all the time okay and um, this is the turbulent forcing power so there's a forcing term and there's a forcing power term in the energy equation and then we have two terms due to gravity so there's gravitational acceleration and the gravitational potential term okay now i'll just briefly describe what setup we had so we set this up in a grid uh, in a box with grid so uh basically it's an eulerian grid with 1024 cube elements so this box was divided into tiny very tiny elements and then we numerically solved all these euler equations okay uh now this is the momentum equation and we adjusted our driving regime such that our mach numbers were close to the icm mach numbers okay the mach number is like it's the ratio of velocity to the speed of sound so the velocity of gas is 1/4 the speed of sound in this case and then the richardson number here i'm defining it again uh, not defining i'm stating it again which is the ratio of buoyancy to turbulent force okay uh, so you see the v square term uh, and the rho g term rho g minus grad p term so that term will give you n square which is uh, what we came across earlier in a couple of couple of slides back you can also see it as a ratio of time scales so n square is the ratio of buoyant uh, is the time scale of is the frequency of buoyancy oscillations n so basically if you are displacing a parcel it goes up and down at that frequency and vl by l is the eddy turnover time scale at your driving length scale so that's like a turbulent time scale so if n is much larger then you can say that buoyancy will dominate and if vl by l is larger than n uh, then you will say that turbulence will dominate so if richardson number is greater than 1 we say it is strongly stratified or if richardson number is less than 1 we say it's weakly stratified okay now we we'll look at some density projection maps which which is basically what we are looking at in the previous two plots as well which is we have integrated density along the x axis okay x axis is our line of sight and we have integrated density along it so sigma x basically stands for density uh, integrated along line of sight and, it, and it's called column density and in the second one i'll show column density fluctuations which means at every z i have divided the column density by the mean density at that height okay and in the third one i'll <coughs> present a slice along the x axis it's at x equal to 0 and i'll show the fluctuations basically by dividing at the mean at that particular z at particular z okay so <coughs> we have set up a box and now we are driving turbulence in it you can see turbulence is establishing itself you don't see the effects of turbulence much in the left plots which is the direct density that you're looking at but if you look at the fluctuations uh, you see that a lot of stuff is happening and you see a lot more detail in the density uh, slice plots <coughs> now one important thing to notice is that uh, as you increase the richardson number the density fluctuations are increasing right uh, richardson number is zero in the topmost one which means it's pure turbulence with no gravity and as you come the, down in richardson number 1 that's where the turbulent time scale and the uh, buoyancy time scale are the same and richardson number 13 is when buoyancy time scale is uh, much shorter compared to the turbulent time scale so there are some other features that you can see uh, so one of them is in the richardson number 13 case you see that most of the velocities is occurring in this plane and it's not gas is not moving up and down along the z direction because it's not uh, suitable in terms of energy 
So gas doesn't really have the energy to rise or fall along the z direction. Whereas in all the other ones, you see that you see almost circular eddies, whereas here you see pancake-like eddies. Uh, so basically you're forming these kind of layers in which the fluid is moving instead of moving circularly. Now, another thing which I noticed and which was very important for uh, interpreting my results uh, in this particular movie is that if you look at the Richardson Vaughan simulation in the uh, second column, basically look at the column density fluctuations, uh, the downward facing arrows are generally blue in color and the upward facing arrows are generally red in color. Now that happens because the velocity field is set by turbulence, but because of uh, stratification, now you're moving a parcel of gas upward with a positive velocity. Now what happens is, <coughs> there it will appear as a positive density fluctuation, right? Because density is decreasing as you go upward. Whereas if you take a gas parcel down from its natural position, it's going to act as, look like a negative density fluctuation. So because the gas below is denser. Now, I actually use this to uh, motivate uh, some scaling relations between density and Mach number and Z direction displacement. So this was re really important. And I just noticed this while looking at one of these movies. So it's important to look at some fi fine details when you're doing these kind of simulations. Uh, <clears throat> now let's look at the time evolution of some volume averaged quantities, okay? Uh, so first we look at Mach number. So Mach number is the ratio of the RMS velocity to the speed of sound. Okay, this is the RMS Mach number to be exact. Now the RMS Mach number is the same for uh, all these different profiles, but which basically tells you that I am driving them in the same way. I'm basically churning them in exactly the same way. So they almost overlap. But if you look at the density fluctuation, so this is density fluctuation versus time. Now, uh, here you see that as you increase the Richardson number, which is increasing the strength of gravity, oops, uh, sorry, uh, the amplitude of density fluctuation is increasing. This is basically the same exact thing we saw in the middle and last panels of the movies, just that we are presenting them uh, in some volume averaged RMS plots. Uh, okay, I should have explained the x-axis before. X-axis is T by T turb, T turb is the same as eddy turnover time. So it is L by VL at the driving length scale. Now, uh, <clears throat> a couple more things. You see that as you start driving turbulence, the Mach number keeps increasing, which means the velocity is increasing until it reaches some sort of steady state at around uh, Mach number 0.25, and then it starts stabilizing there. This is because when you inject energy into turbulence, it will set up, it will basically, you're basically <clears throat> injecting energy into very large eddies and then after some time th this eddy breaks into smaller eddies and the smaller eddies break into even smaller eddies and then it gets in the end uh, a whole cascade is established so and you have steady state turbulence so that's why after around two eddy turnover times your Mach number doesn't change because the amount of energy you inject is equal to the amount of energy coming out through viscosity okay uh, so you're injecting energy that's going down in the cascade and then going out in the viscous landscape. Now, <clears throat> if you look at density fluctuations and compare the Richardson number zero, which, has, which is pure turbulence. Uh, okay, Raghav has a good question. I'll come to that a bit later. Uh, and then uh, looking at uh, Richardson number 0 0.003. So we have introduced a tiny bit of gravity. So gravity is really weak. Uh, you see that there's almost no density in uh, fluctuation enhancement. But as you keep increasing uh, the uh, Richardson number, uh, this density fluctuations also keep increasing. Okay, coming to Raghav's question. Uh, yes, we are using solenoidal uh, driving. Uh, solenoidal means the divergence of our forcing field is zero, okay, which means our eddies are all like this. Okay, we are not driving uh, gas like this but we are driving them like this, okay? Uh, so the divergence of the forcing field is zero. Compressive driving means the curl of the forcing field would be zero, which means the, they're all like this. The forcing field would be all pointing like this. So if you looked at the movie, we were mainly looking at circular eddies like that. Uh, of course, the driving terminal uh, uh, impact 
will have an impact uh, whether it is solenoidal compressive, but we have chosen it to be solenoidal. So we are just choosing one less uh, parameter to deal with. Uh, we wanted to focus just on the impact of gravitational strength. That's why uh, we focused on the solenoidal value. Okay. Now coming to uh, kinetic energy along the z direction. So uh, we saw that the Mach number was almost the same. But if you look specifically at the z direction kinetic energy, it looks like as you increase gravity, you see the orange plots are with the strongest gravity and the red and blue ones are with the weakest gravity or no gravity. So as you increase the strength of gravity or Richardson number, uh, then the kinetic energy along the z direction starts decreasing. And this happens because it's being converted into the potential energy. So the quantity that I had shown previously, which was this delta rho by rho times n. So I had normalized it to make something which had the same dimensions as velocity. So now I have used that to plot the potential energy uh, as a function of time. So as you see, uh, when you keep increasing the strength of gravity, uh, the potential energy uh, keeps on increasing. Uh, whereas the kinetic energy along the z direction keeps decreasing. So this again tells you that uh, the z direction kinetic energy is converted into potential energy, which is kind of obvious that when you are throwing some parcels of gas up, Due to, uh, due to the effects of buoyancy, they're losing their uh, uh, kinetic energy into gaining potential energy. Okay, so as Richardson number increases, uh, the z direction kinetic energy decreases, whereas the buoyancy potential energy increases. Now let's look at uh, density and pressure fluctuations without stratification. Okay, uh, so without any gravity. I will not focus a lot on this. Uh, I can talk about this later on after the talk if you have questions because we are focusing on the effect of gravity. This is just to give us a starting point on what happens without gravity and what will have what extra things will happen when you add gravity. So now we are looking at a 2D PDF. Okay, the, the color indicates how much uh, how many grid points have this kind of relation. Okay, now this is pressure versus density. So this PDF will give you an idea of the equation of state of the gas. Now you see that all the fluctuations of this gas are about uh, this adiabatic line, which stands for delta P being gamma times delta rho. Now the bar indicates that these have all been normalized with respect to their profile. Well, this is without stratification, so we don't need to bother about that. But delta P is gamma times delta rho, which means this is an adiabatic equation of state. So the fluctuations themselves are adiabatic. So you can even plot density fluctuations multiplied by gamma. So delta R is gamma times density fluctuations and delta P is uh, just pressure fluctuations. And if you plot them as a function of the RMS Mach number, they almost lie on top of each other. That's really amazing. And if you uh, look at the scaling as a function of Mach number, in for subsonic turbulence without stratification, density fluctuations and pressure fluctuations both are proportional to the square of Mach number. Okay. Uh, this is important and we will be uh, using this to motivate some of the other things that we derive. So we did uh, Pratik and I, uh, so this was a part of my ISC project, uh, which we published in 2019. Uh, and uh, this was one of the plots there. Uh, so if you want to know more details of this, it would be better to go there. I am mainly going to focus on the effect of gravity. Okay, now if you look at density versus the z direction PDF. So this is now coming back to uh, the effect of gravity. Okay, uh, in the first one, you see that this, uh, so if there's some sort of correlation, then uh, we'll see that when density fluctuations are positive, Vz is positive. So basically the fluctuations will be correlated in some sort. But in the first one, without gravity, you see that there's almost no correlation, right? Uh, density uh, and Vz, there's no correlation. But as you keep on increasing gravity, this PDF starts rotating anti-clockwise, right? So what does that say? That positive density fluctuations are caused by positive Vz and negative density fluctuations are caused by negative Vz. So basically what is happening is you have this density stratified medium with dense gas below and rarer gas above, and you're churning this gas around. So you're driving turbulence in it. 
Now what turbulence is doing is simply, uh, it's taking a parcel of gas, moving it up. Now here, because it is moving up, it's at an area where the density, the ambient density is lower than the gas parcel's original density. So it appears as a positive density fluctuation. That's why you're seeing this correlation between density and Vz. Okay, and similarly, when you take it down, now the, because the gas density increases as you go below, now you have churned it, you're basically taking this gas around and around. Now, when it goes down, you see that uh, its uh, density is lower than the ambient density. That's why it appears as a negative density fluctuation with a negative Vz velocity. Okay, uh, so as you increase Richard's number or gravity, the PDF starts rotating anti-clockwise. Now, looking at pressure versus density PDF. Uh, so the top left plot here uh, is the one without any gravity, which I showed a couple of slides back. Uh, and then we are going to increase gravity. So notice how the Richardson number is changing in all of the insets. And as you keep on increasing gravity, you see that this PDF is spreading around along the uh, parallel to the density axis, right? And perpendicular to the pressure axis, <coughs> which means these new density fluctuations that we are talking about, which are caused by uh, the stratification are isobaric in nature because the pressure is not changing for these density fluctuations. <clears throat> okay, um, you see in the end, we have basically spread out parallel to the density uh, axis and uh, perpendicular to pressure, right? So the density fluctuations are isobaric. Now, <clears throat> this is an observational result. I'll not go very deep into it. This basically shows what's the fraction of isobaric to adiabatic uh, density fluctuations or isothermal in different galaxy clusters. So A2029, Hydra A85, these are all different gal <coughs> galaxy clusters. <coughs> and Irina Zravleva, they looked at, uh, she and her group, they looked at all these different galaxy clusters and uh, tried to find out what's the nature of the density fluctuations in these galaxy clusters. And they found that they were mainly isobaric and not adiabatic. So pure turbulence was causing adiabatic density fluctuations, whereas buoyancy, uh, this buoyancy density fluctuations can be isobaric in nature which means these could very well be happening in galaxy clusters, right? So galaxy clusters are density stratified and there is some turbulence. So this could be contributing significantly to the isobaric density fluctuations, okay? Uh, so Richardson number increases, adiabatic starts becoming isobaric. Now let's try to derive a scaling relation between density fluctuations, pressure fluctuations, and the Mach number. So we noticed that without any stratification, these quantities varied with the square of Mach number. So this is something that I presented a few slides back. Uh, now, if you look at the buoyancy density fluctuations, the pressure fluctuations associated with them is zero because they're isobaric, right? So delta P is zero. And delta rho, the density fluctuations due to buoyancy, which I've, termed by, which I've shown by delta rho buoy, that is positive. Now delta P, so it should be unaffected by stratification. And delta rho boy, we noticed that it was correlated with the Z direction velocity. So there should be some way to write this in terms of the Z direction displacement because it is correlated with the Z direction velocity. So now let's try to derive the scaling relation. Okay, let's look at the, start from the left side and slowly go to the right side. Uh, uh, it's a very big equation, I know, uh, but uh, we'll go slowly, okay? So earlier on, a few slides back, I had shown that when you displace a gas particle along the Z direction, uh, it will start oscillating with this frequency N squared, right? And then in that derivation, we had this expression for delta rho, where, which we had expressed in terms of N squared by G squared delta Z squared. So we are going to use that relation. And here itself, you see that delta rho is being correlated to delta Z. And after this, you just substitute the values of n square. So n square, we had this value, uh, and then we substitute the value for delta z square. So what we say is delta z is correlated to the driving length scale. We say that it's zeta times the driving length scale. So the mean displacement of a gas parcel along z direction is some fraction of the driving length scale. So we are churning gas around, and we are saying that the mean displacement along z direction is some part of the size of the eddy at which you're driving at, okay? So I guess that's a very reasonable approximation. Now, 
here it starts looking a bit complicated. So again, let's start from the leftmost part. The leftmost part, I basically substituted the expressions for n square and delta z square. And then, okay, that's an extra equal to sign. Then you just start substituting the values of Richardson number n square. So you just start putting all the expressions together, substitute the speed of sound in, and then you'll end up with the rightmost part. So delta rho poi square is zeta square max square Richardson number times HP by HS. So this is a bit complicated, but if you take some time, maybe after this talk, if you really want to check this, it is very simple. You can totally derive this. Okay. Uh, I actually derived this in one particular morning and this in fact explained our density fluctuations as a function of Richardson number amazingly well. Okay. Uh, now here we are looking at density fluctuations as a function of Richardson number. Okay. Actually we are looking at the square of density fluctuations. Now the B square Mach fourth term that comes from the turbulence because density fluctuations vary as square of Mach number. So the square of it will vary as the quadratic, uh, the fourth power of Mach number. Now the second term is the one we just derived and the constant of proportionality in front is basically a fitting parameter. Okay. So this actually fits our results well till almost Richardson number one. Okay. It breaks down for Richardson number much higher than one. Well, at least we have derived something that holds for all this, uh, for Richardson number from 10 to the power minus three to 10 to the power zero. So that's pretty good. And we published it, uh, earlier this year. Uh, okay. Now, if you look at pressure fluctuations, uh, they don't vary with Richardson number at all. Now that's again, an amazing result that we have all these different levels of gravitational stratification and so much, all this turbulence that we are looking at. Uh, and we only have a turbulence dependent term, the Mach number dependent term. So pressure fluctuations were gamma times density fluctuations and they were proportional to Mach squared. So the square of pressure fluctuations uh, is proportional to the fourth power of Mach number. Okay. Uh, can you tell me how much time I have left? Uh, so that I can decide whether to do the next few slides or not. I think you have around five to 10 minutes. Uh, five to 10 minutes. All right. Uh, thanks. So uh, in turbulence, we like to look at uh, power spectra. Okay. I uh, Power spectra is basically how the uh, Fourier, so how the power in is basically distributed as a function of different length scales. Okay. Uh, and we will look at this in the Fourier space. So if you look at the velocity power spectrum in turbulence, uh, if you have done a fluid mechanics course, you may know that it is supposed to vary as k to the power five by three. So the velocity uh, power spectrum uh, varies with the wave number k as k to the power minus five by three. That's what, but that's in the some limit of incompressible, homogeneous, idealized turbulence. So it's a very idealistic scenario, which you don't really have here. But uh, so in this plot, I'm looking at the normalized uh, velocity power spectrum, which means I've multiplied this k to the power five by three factor in front. Okay. Uh, and we see that the slopes are not really that steep. They're like k minus 1.8 instead of minus 1.66, which is uh, that for idealized turbulence. Okay. Uh, but uh, okay. So basically if you, even if you increase stratification, uh, it doesn't affect the slope or the amplitude. But if you look at uh, the ratio of parallel to perpendicular power, so uh, we look at what's the po power distribution between eddies that go like this and eddies that go like this, okay? So eddies which have components along the z direction and which are in x, y. Now you see that after Richardson number one, there's significant amount of power in the z direction for uh, Richardson number, uh, greater than one, right? For Richardson number 13, uh, which is the orange plot, we have this uh, anisotropy that is happening, which means X, Y, and Z don't have the equal power distribution. This is totally expected for uh, stratified turbulence though. And if you look at density power spectrum, well, we would expect the power to increase because that's basically proportional to the RMS value of density fluctuations, which was increasing. Uh, but the slope also changes and it follows some sort of weird behavior where it peaks at Richardson number one. Now, I don't really have the time to go into the details of this. 
So I'll just uh, show you that even the density power spectrum is anisotropic in the sense that the Z direction density modes don't have the same amount of power as the X, Y direction density modes. I know this is becoming a bit complicated. Uh, so maybe if you have questions later, I will try to take some time to answer this. Uh, the power spectrum is a little complicated to un understand. Uh, but <clears throat> one thing to just get from here is that as you keep increasing Richard's number uh, and it becomes greater than one, uh, then you have anisotropy happening. So if they are flat and, at, and the values are 10 to the power zero, uh, turbulence is isotropic, whereas uh, if Richard's number is greater than one, it is anisotropic. <clears throat> now we are coming to this holy ratio eta k. Now this was the literature value that uh, people were quoting, right? Eta k is one. So this is when you're looking at surface brightness power spectrum, and then you're looking at density fluctuations, and you're converting density to velocity fluctuations. So this is really important for uh, observations because we have the resolution to look at density, only the density fluctuations and not the pressure fluctuations right now. So P, this ratio eta k is very important to measure dense velocities of the ICM gas. But what we find, this is eta squared, but we find that eta is actually dependent on the amount of stratification you have and eta square is proportional to the Richardson number, okay? Uh, so basically, eta is not really one. It may approach one as you keep increasing your stratification, but it's never really one. So this, the left side plot, which is used in observation, really lacks calibration right now. Now, we did a follow-up project of this. Uh, okay, how much time do I have left now? Five minutes. I, so, five minutes, okay. Uh, I have around five slides. Okay, let me see if I can go through that. Okay, so this is a follow-up simulation. Uh, now, here I start characterizing things by a fruit number. Now, fruit number is something very slightly different. Fruit is basically one by square root of Richardson number. So, it's basically the inverse of Richardson number. So, if now I say fruit number is less than one. That means buoyancy is stronger than, uh, buoyancy forces are stronger than uh, the turbulence forces. Uh, so in this figure on the right side, this will be a movie soon uh, uh, when I start playing it. So you have the, we basically did 96 simulations. So we had these three parameters, Mach number, Richardson number, HV by HS, which we showed that density fluctuations depend on this. Now we just try to scan all of this for the entire parameter regime of uh, uh, turbulence in the ICM. And we did this through 96 simulations. Okay. Uh, now fruit number is basically this quantity, one by square root of Richardson number. And in the right side plot that you see, the fruit number is decreasing by around a factor of eight as you keep going down. Whereas when you go from left to right, the fruit number is almost constant. But if you go from left to right, the Mach number increases by a factor of eight. Okay, uh, so roughly eight to 10. Now, basically, if you go from top to bottom, that will tell you the impact of fruit number. And if you go left to right, that will tell you the impact of Mach number on the density fluctuations. So this is again, integrated density fluctuations that I'll show. And the insets are showing the actual density where I have not normalized them. <coughs> and you see that, it seems to depend quite strongly on the Mach number. That's one of the things you'll notice that when you go from left to right, even though the factor increases the same, the increase due to Mach number is uh, much higher. It's almost saturated uh, because I was using the same color scheme, red and blue are almost saturated on the right side. But even as you keep going down, there's a slight increase in the density of the colors, right? Which means as you decrease the fruit number, uh, which is increasing stratification, your density fluctuations are still increasing. But the dependence is somewhat weaker. Again, if you look at the lowermost left plot, all the velocities are all horizontal, right? That's because uh, of anisotropy. So your eddies, your gas is moving only like this and not like this. Uh, now, yeah, so this is mock same fruit uh, decreasing. I should have yeah, done this before. So we have done 96 simulations of this. And we have a variety of resolutions depending on how much we required. And we have again, just looked at the density and pressure fluctuations as a function of these dimensionless numbers. 
Okay, and we have extra. So our previous scaling relation didn't work when Richard's number was greater than one. In this work, we extended it uh, somewhat further. Uh, okay. Now, first, let's look at how does the velocity ratio. So we are again looking at the anisotropy, but here it is a somewhat more comprehensible quantity in the sense that we have taken the RMS velocity along z direction, and we have compared it against the RMS velocity in the xy plane. Okay. Now, for idealized turbulence, when you don't have any gravity, you would expect this ratio to be one. So in the rightmost part of this plot, uh, it is at high fruit, which is basically without uh, any stratification, this ratio is around one. And as you keep increasing stratification, now we are moving from right to left in this plot. As you move from right to left, the amount of z direction velocity slowly decreases. This is similar to what we are seeing much before, where the kinetic energy along z direction was decreasing when we were increasing the stratification. It's basically almost the same effect. But if you around fruit 0.5, you see there's a sharp decrease, okay? Uh, around 0.5, yeah, so 0.5 or 0.3, there's a sharp decrease in this ratio. This is where the anisotropy becomes really significant. And this is what was causing our density uh, fluctuations relation that we have derived to not work in the strong stratification limit. Now, I'm just quickly describing fruit number again. It's the ratio of buoyancy time scale to turbulent time scale. Buoyancy time scale will be 1 by n. Turbulent time scale will be u by l. And it can be also written as 1 by square root of Richardson number. This is weakly stratified regime where it's uh, the ratio between this velocity and this velocity is weakly decreasing with increasing stratification. Whereas in strongly stratified regime, it decreases very strongly. <coughs> now we'll try to quickly try to find out what happens in the strong stratification limit. So I was using delta z uh, to be proportional to the <coughs> to be proportional to the driving length scale, right? I was saying delta z is that mean displacement along z direction. And I was saying it's like zeta times l, uh, where l is your driving length scale if you're churning eddies of this size. So it's some fraction of that eddy. But in this case, in strongly stratified turbulence, what happens is these z direction motions are not happening anymore. So it's basically oscillations that are happening. So if, even if you try to move some gas parcel upward, it will just start oscillating. And so that gives you a new way to characterize the z direction displacement, which is the ratio of the z direction velocity divided by the frequency of oscillation. So that basically gives you another way to characterize the length scale. And the velocity distribution is not isotropic. And we saw, just now saw that Vz is proportional to V perp to the power, uh, V perp times root to the power 0. 0.5. So that fall off at the high strat, large stratification regime was proportional to root to the power 0. 0.5. You can even show this theoretically. Uh, uh, the uh, derivatives, so I have derived this in this paper that we have just submitted, Well, it's not. So I can share that with you later on. So it is possible to show that. And then we again do all these simplified calculations. And we show that in the end, the relation that we get is that the Richardson number in the previous relation is replaced by the fruit number. So earlier it was zeta square mark squared Richardson number times HP by HS. Now it is fruit number times HP by HS. Now note that as you increase stratification, fruit number decreases. So that means now when you're increasing stratification in the strongly stratified limit, the density fluctuations decrease. That's because you're unable to move gas in the z direction anymore. Okay. Uh, so now I'll try to write a functional form which tries to take both of these things into account. It will look very complicated, but I'll try to break it down for you. Okay. Now this is again the density fluctuation squared. So this is with all our 96 simulations. So we have a lot of data points here. And our scaling relation fits this data really well. Uh, so I'll try to break this uh, relation down for you. So let's just focus on the part in the lowermost part of this uh, slide. So you have the B square Mark fourth term, which I already talked about before. Now this is the weak stratification limit. So if you ignore the second part of the term for weak stratification, uh, so fruit number is relatively large there, like let's say fruit around one, then the second term will be in this denominator will be much smaller than the first term. 
So <coughs> this will become entire term will become one by fruit square, which is basically Richardson number. So this is what we got in our previous paper. And then the second term, it starts dominating in the lower fruit limit. So when fruit is let's say less than 0.1, then you can ignore the first term in the denominator. So what you will be left with is one by square root of fruit square in the denominator, which will just become fruit number in the denom in the numerator. So that will give you the relation that we just derived. Okay, this is a bit complicated, but if you have a proper look at this and then you try to simplify this relation in two different regimes, it will give you two different scaling relations. But amazingly, that works for the entire parameter regime that we considered. Now, if you look at pressure fluctuations, <coughs> they are totally independent of stratification for all these parameter space that we scanned, even in the strong, st strongly stratified turbulence limit. Now, I earlier told you that pressure fluctuations can be detected through these SZ effect observations, which are basically upscatter of the CMB background. And then if you have the pressure fluctuations from that, you can use them to calculate, uh, to measure velocities. And because this is independent of stratification, it doesn't depend on what kind of cluster you're looking for or any other parameter, basically. So pressure fluctuations are a much better parameter to uh, look at, uh, to measure gas velocities. Okay, uh, because they scale so well. Okay, now if you try to look at the same plot as a function of Mach number, so let's start with the lower one, which is somewhat simpler. So pressure fluctuations versus squared versus Mach number. So these still vary as Mach to the power four, which is even without gravity, without any stratification, this is what it would have shown. Whereas if you look at density fluctuation, it shows a whole different range of variations. So it is pretty complicated. We'll not try to go into the details of that, but this is basically how density fluctuations scale. And they're very difficult to model. Now, again, you can look at eta, which was the Fourier ratio. Uh, okay, uh, oops. So if you look at eta, uh, again, eta is the ratio between velocity and density power spectrum. So it is density power spectrum divided by velocity power spectrum, okay? Now, eta people assume that to be one in, and they were using that in observations. We found that eta strongly depends on the fruit number over this different regime. Uh, the scaling relations are very similar to that of density fluctuations. So I'll not go into details of that. I will uh, get rid of all this math and show you our conclusions. Okay, uh, sorry, it got a bit mathsy towards the end. Uh, hopefully uh, you're still catching. Uh, uh, okay, so we derived scaling relations between density fluctuations uh, that holds across uh, a whole range of fruit numbers. Now we needed it to work across all these different regimes because in galaxy clusters, you can have many different ranges of stratification. Uh, the fruit numbers can be very high towards the cluster center and they can be very uh, low sorry, they can be very low towards the center of the cluster and very high in the outskirts of cluster. It can be very different. So uh, it's important to derive the scaling relation that holds across all these different regimes. And we found that the pressure fluctuations were independent of uh, any gravity, uh, any stratification parameters. Density fluctuations were becoming isobaric as you increase stratification. And this matches with the recent observations of the ICM gas where we found that the density fluctuations were also isobaric. Velocity power spectrum stays the same, but the density power spectrum increases in amplitude and also the slope changes somewhat. I didn't talk a lot about that. Uh, for the fruit less than one regime, so this is in the strongly stratified turbulence, which was the second part of this talk. We saw that velocity and density fields, they were both showing an isotropy. In fact, the ratio of V in the Z direction to that in the perpendicular direction was decreasing a lot uh, in the strongly stratified turbulence limit. Now the scaling relations, uh, which was uh, basically how density fluctuations were scaling with fruit number that was becoming flatter. Uh, that's basically also shown in the scaling relation that I put up there. Now there's a lot of future work that can be done here. We have to include magnetic fields, cooling of ICM gas because I already, I started this talk by talking about the cooling flow problem and I didn't really have cooling in these simulations. 
and then there are other things like uh, uh, Raghav mentioned that driving uh, parameter. So there is this driving parameter B in my simulations. I haven't changed that, uh, and it can really impact what's the how much density fluctuations will happen, and the driving length scale. So there are a bunch of different things that can still be varied, uh, which we haven't done. Okay, so I'm done. Uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, yeah, thank you for the talk. questions. Yeah, people can either raise their hand or uh, post the questions to the chat. So Raghav has already put up a question. Yes, uh, that's a very good question. That fruit and Richardson numbers are important for scaling. Can we calculate fruit number observationally? It's very difficult. Yeah. So right now. With uh, the real observation, see the fruit number. Uh, it's fundamentally you need the velocity, right? Uh, yes. Because fruit number is u divided by n l. You can calculate the brunt voisel oscillation frequency n. You you basically have some model for the density, and from that you can calculate what will be this oscillation frequency. You can even have some estimate of the driving length scale. now uh, by looking at what's the energy injection scale for example here we are showing that it was those bubbles right so we know the size of the bubbles mm -hmm. but uh, you need u which is yeah. exactly the thing you are trying to measure yeah that's so it's it's sad that the thing that you are trying to measure depend is included in one of the parameters so but in case it's in the strongly stratified limit so there are other work arounds for example let's say uh, you manage to look at the anisotropy in these cases for example you compare between the you know you look at a galaxy cluster you compare between the radial and the tangential parts uh, yeah. of the density so you look at the density structures and you compare between the radial and tangential from that maybe you can get an estimate of the fruit number just by looking at uh, how different they are so basically what i'm talking about is this particular plot where we were looking at the power difference between uh, z z direction which is parallel to gravity uh, stratification mm -hmm. and perpendicular to stratification mm -hmm. and you look at the ratio between these two powers and uh, basically at around this orange wherever this orange point reaches one that's around the scale where fruit number is one so from that maybe you can estimate the fruit number but it's really hard again uh, okay that's it yes that's yeah, a thanks, good everybody. question yeah it's all. so one of my future plans is to try to find a way to do this in the icm oh okay oh, shh, don't tell anyone <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah any uh, other questions? anyone else has any question they can either raise their hand or uh, post to the chat Okay, I don't think uh, anybody has any questions. Uh, thank you once again, Rashikar, like for giving this wonderful talk. Uh, Thanks for organizing. I think Raghav is typing something. Okay, one sec. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you can uh, try to unmute you. Yeah, thanks a lot. So, uh, so uh, looking at this plot, like I had this question earlier before, like what happens with Are Richardson number thirteen in the lower plot? Like, like you did this experiment? So yeah, for... so yeah, this that's also a good question. Uh, so what happens is uh, you are starting to have pancake-like vortices. So hmm. let me try to show you one of the movies. Uh, there you can see this. Let's see this place. So look at focus on the lowermost one. Okay. Mm -hmm. so you see uh, the the eddy structure that you are getting is basically pancakes so these are yeah. pancake vortices and because of that there's a flattening of the wave number space as well so okay. basically the power in kz 
So I think, uh, yeah, because the length scale along Z decreases, it's small. that means okay. the length scale along KZ will increase. Yes. Right? Yes. Because KZ is the inverse of this. KZ yeah. will increase. And that's why I think what happens is the density power spectrum basically gets contracted along the Z direction. Okay. And, and so that was for Richardson number. Greater than yeah, one. So, yes. so that was for Richard. This is for Richardson number 13. That yeah, means yeah. So, for, for, since you estimate, so in your future study, you read it for more Richardson numbers, right? Mm -hmm. So did you find this for higher Richardson numbers too? Like, oh, I didn't do many power spectra there. Oh, okay. I was focusing on this density fluctuation scaling. Uh -huh. so, so it would be, I haven't done it yet. I think. Yeah, yeah, it is expected. Actually, many uh, fluid dynamics people do a lot of this work, okay. uh, especially that this uh, person called Lindborg, Eric Lindborg. Mm -hmm. He has done a lot of work. Uh, and then there's uh, in IIT Kanpur, we have Mahendra Bharma. He also does a lot of uh, buoyancy okay. turbulence work. I've heard of one. I've heard of him. He does. He also works on sun, right? Magneto hydrodynamics. So, so if you are interested in these, so basically they look at the spectra in much more detail because they uh, work with uh, some different code. They work with uh, spectral code, which is somewhat different from our code because you they work in, flash, in the right? Fourier space, basically. They solve the Euler equations in the Fourier space. So oh. that's how, uh, it, I mean, uh, you have much more spectral data and spectral analysis for them uh, compared yeah, to what yeah. we do. Because we are working in the real space. Yeah. These are all in flash, right? Yes. Oh, okay. Interesting. Nice. Thanks a lot, Raj. It was a very informative and nice talk. I'm glad I attended. I think it became a bit technical towards the second half uh, when I yeah, came but... into my research. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we, yeah. We expect that, I think, like, because.